to Church Online, we're so excited that you're with us here today. While you're tuning in, you can expect engaging worship and an encouraging message. You'll also notice that there's a community of people watching alongside you, and we'd love to interact with you, so please leave us a comment. We'd love to tell you a quick story of how The Bridge is able to serve our community right now. Hey, we are so excited to update you about a few ways The Bridge Church is serving our community during this season. First, we are partnering with the YMCA and Bridge Youth Center to help provide meals for students age 18 and under. So starting this week, we will have meals available Monday through Friday at lunch and dinner times. If you'd like more information, contact us at hello at thebridgechurch.cc. The other way we're getting involved is by providing meal delivery, grocery delivery for those who need it. So if you are above the age of 60 or have a compromised immune system, we would love to help you by delivering groceries to your home. You can email us your needs at hello at thebridgechurch.cc or give us a call 641-682-9260. Before we jump into worship, we wanna make you aware of two links that you can find in the description below. The first one is a place where you can request prayer. We would love to be praying for you throughout this difficult time. And the second one is a place where you can give online to continue to support the kingdom work that God is doing. Thanks again, we hope that you really enjoy this service.
So
Well, hey, today we are starting a new series on the book of Habakkuk, and uh, I kind of want to set it up like this. My family and I, we went to Minnesota on the front end of the week, and this is a typical trip for us. We do three, four times a year, and if you're a parent who's ever traveled with little children, you hear this question, and you're just kind of a little bit annoyed because it's not asked once. It's asked over and over again. Here's the question, how much longer. And I'm just like, for real, because here's the reality. We were 20 minutes into the drive. It's not like they don't know this trip is going to take a long time. We're on the way home. We just did the trip two days ago. And here it is. My daughter, who's nine, goes, how much longer? I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to have to answer this question 10, 12, 15 more times. I'm like, four hours and 40 minutes. And she goes, so are we close? I'm like, ah, But the tension of that question, I think, is one that all of us are facing right now. I think a lot of us want to know, how much longer is this going to go on like this? You're hearing the words unprecedented, never before. And so all of us are searching for an ending. All of us are going back in time to find out what can we compare this to so we can start to get some semblance of footing, and yet no one's giving anybody any clue of what's next. The only thing we know to do is ask the question, how long? I was listening to the radio, and uh, one, of the, one of the radio hosts was interviewing a medical professional who's kind of on the front lines of all of this, and he asked this very question. He, he said, in your expert opinion, how long before things can go back to the way they were? Like, how long will it be before we're where it was six months ago? I, I, I'm guessing you're asking the same question. I know I am. I'm like, how long? And I, I've kind of thrown out different projections. And then once you know it, like 24 hours pass, and you're like, well, that changes that reality. And, and yet the question is still there. It's unanswered. How long is it going to be like this? Maybe, maybe you, you're sitting watching this and you're asking, how long am I going to be laid off? <laughs> maybe you're a parent and you're like, how long before school starts again? Maybe, maybe you're asking the question, how long will my groceries last? Or, you know, how long will the economy be struggling? Like, will it bounce back right away? How long do I have to stay inside my own home? I just want to go back to normal. And, and we're not getting any answers that are really resolving this question, how long? And, the, and what I've learned is this question has been around for a really long time. It's not like brand new. Before this pandemic was even with us, my guess is you were facing a different how long. Like, how long will I be single? How how long before me and my spouse get pregnant? How long do I have to stay in this job that's miserable? How long before I get a job? I think maybe you're asking, how long will the hurt that I'm feeling from the deep wounds someone put inside me, how long will that last? Maybe you lost a loved one. And you wake up and you know things, things are different. And you say, how long? See, when I was thinking about the message for today, it was the question that came in mind and I immediately went to this Old Testament minor prophet named Habakkuk. He's he's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, yet he has his own book of the Bible. And he starts with this question, God, how long? I think you kind of word it in today's words, like, hey, Lord, what are you doing? Maybe, Maybe you're... There And I I just find studying his book, studying his words, studying his conversation with God, I think it will give us some new new ways to stand strong in the midst of the unknown. And so I want to kind of bring some encouragement. And and in order to do that, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory of Habakkuk. Uh, Most likely, he um, was raised around 600 B.C., and he probably grew up during the time of King Josiah. Now, King Josiah, probably not a normal king. You've heard of King David or Solomon, but King Josiah may be a little bit fuzzy on. Here's, here's what happened. His dad 
was a horrible, horrible man. He hated God. He was opposed to God. And he was, he was just mean. And so his own officials in his government assassinated him with every intent of becoming the new king. However, the people didn't like that they assassinated the king, so they killed him, and they made his son the king. It sounds like a normal transfer of power, keeping it within the family line. Until you hear the fact that Josiah was eight years old. Now, I, just, just humor me for a moment. Think of an eight-year-old. Like I have a nine-year-old daughter, or I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Craig's son Crosby is around eight. And I'm, I'm just thinking their game plan for running the country is free candy for everyone, right? Like, you know, here, what, what's going on when, when you have, like, we've had two assassinations back to back. I know, let's make the eight-year-olds in charge. That'll be a good idea. But here's the thing. Josiah was, was somehow anointed with a desire to pursue God. And throughout his reign over the kingdom of Judah, he started putting in reforms and a revival started to take place. He it actually says that one day they were doing some construction work on the temple and they found the words of God. It was as if the people had had leadership that had forgotten about God and then a leader stepped in and, and Josiah was just like, I think we need to kind of get back to what was right, what was true. And then they come to him and they say, we found the word. And he's like, let's read it. Let's, let's, let's do what it says. And so this huge revival takes place. Now, Josiah... He ends up eventually growing older and he, go, getting older and he dies. And he has one son who then is somehow like kidnapped and brought into captivity in Egypt. I mean, some of you are like, this is, is this on Netflix? No, it's actually in your Bible. It's so entertaining. Uh, you got to read through like 2 Kings to find it, just so you know. And then, and then his other son, he is completely opposed to God. And this is the time when Habakkuk shows up. And he starts writing. Everything is falling apart. And, and, and I'm going to jump in. Habakkuk chapter 1, here it is. He says, how long? How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? Do you see what's going on? God, I'm needing some help. Where are you? And then I, I'm, I'm guessing this isn't the first time he's come to God asking for help because he says, you don't listen. Have you ever felt like your prayers aren't being heard? Like what matters to you doesn't seem to matter to him? Have you ever been in that stuck reality of like, God, can, can you throw me a bone here? Do you see what's going on? Hey, it's getting a little crazy. How long, oh Lord? How long? And that's, that's just like the burden inside of me. He goes on and he, he's aware in the kingdom of Judah, that this is going on. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. I'm needing some help. You're far from it. Goes on and says this. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Remember, he, he grew up and everyone was pursuing God, and now that's all going the other way. He's like, why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. Some of you are like, was there only four-year-olds and six-year-olds? Like, were there a lot of, I mean, because there's a lot of fighting where I'm at. Everywhere I go. I mean, take parties out of it. People are just more upset about things, right? Go on and says, the law has become paralyzed. <laughs> there's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. Like the things that really I know to be true about what you care about, God, seem to have gone away. How long? And, and when, I, when I read this, the thing that strikes me is this. Habakkuk starts with this line. How long, O Lord? O Lord, how long? And my question is, if you are asking a how long question, who are you going to with it? Because if it's not to God, then you're left with just man's reality. The kingdom here and now. But if you can move to the spot of like, no, 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 no. There is someone above it all who sees it all. I'm going to him. God, 
how long, I think you can start to make some progress. And so I kind of want to walk you through uh, this because Habakkuk, he's dealing with this question of like, I guess the easiest way to put it is like, God, it seems like the bad guys are winning and the good guys are losing. Here, what we have going on is I don't even know who's winning. I mean, maybe Charmin, you know, outside of that, maybe the hand sanitizer. Everyone else seems to be losing. The bad guys, I don't know who they are. I just know it feels like the good guys, humanity, it's not looking good. So what do we do? We go to God and we say, how long? And I think eventually all of us need to wrestle with this. How are you going to go to God with it? I think it's, it's this question where, is God good when you don't get your way? Is God God when you can't see the light of day? Is God above this or is he not? I, I, I'm going to kind of go with three kind of theological points that I don't have time to fully unpack, but I want to give you a little bit of uh, hope and perspective of your question can go to God and he can handle it. Here's the first one. God is the God of all time. There is not a moment of time that God was not present. God was before time existed. God will be here till the end. God oversees it all. And therefore, in our current context, we can be okay because God is the God of all of time. He's not up in heaven going like, whoa, what happened? Hey, hey. No, 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 no. He is still God. He sees it all. Uh, just a couple verses later in Habakkuk, it says this. I, God, am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. Now, for you and I, this will be a little bit of what we talk about next week. What, what happens when God talks and he responds to our question of how long and we don't like what he has to say because he's going to talk about this. Here's what I want to center on. If God is the God of all time, God's the one who raises up things and allows things to happen. So you're, you're saying this is of God? No, no, no. I'm just saying God. God does not allow anything to happen that will overpower his godness. God still got this. The second thing I want to point out is this. God is the God of this time. God is the God of this time. I think sometimes we forget he's present in all times. Habakkuk 1.5 says this. The Lord replied, so God's speaking, look around at the nations. I mean, if you're like me, I'm looking at what's happening in other places. Look and be amazed, for I'm doing something in your own day. God's God in every present moment, not just all of the moments. And in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. Huh. Kind of fitting. Like, I'm doing something in your own day. No. This is important. God is the God of all of time. God is the God of this time. But it's really helpful to understand this too. Number three. God is about his kingdom not ours. And this is, I think, a tricky spot for us to kind of, kind of, kind of dance. Like, are you okay <laughs> with God being God and you not getting your way? I mean, I mean, really, God's after his kingdom moving forward, and he will use any circumstance, any event. It doesn't mean he's behind every harm, every evil. It just means he can use any circumstance to move his kingdom forward. And sometimes those circumstances create a little bit of confusion for us because we're trying to build our kingdom. And God's like, yeah, but that can never, never be what I'm about. I'm not going to share my glory. I, I, I'm, a, I'm above that. I'm drawing all people to me. Don't get lost in, in, in your circumstances, like, whoa, whoa, hey, no, 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 I'm building something here. And God's like, I'm building something that will last, though. I'm the God of all time. I'm God of this time, and I'm about my kingdom. And I love you. You can trust me in this, but it might mean you need to sacrifice your kingdom. And so here's the wrestling point. Will you be honest with God? Like, I love that Habakkuk was honest with God. 
We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week, but can I also paint this picture? Here's two thoughts on what happens when you're not honest with God. There's a couple things that happens, like I need us to wrestle with. The first is we lose our place in the story. See, I'm believing that God is the author. He's he's, he's the, the manuscript writer. And when I quit being honest with the author, I lose my place in his story. My story starts to meander. My story starts to lose significance. My story starts to get rattled because I'm not being honest with him. And he's written something, and he's writing something, and he wants you to be a part of it. And I believe that God is saying, when you're honest with me, we can work together. I believe God's actually writing an opportunity for us as a church to to love our community, to make him more glorified, to praise his name, to worship in these hard times. Here's a second thing that can happen when we're not honest with God. Number two is this. We become obsessed with our circumstances and not the cross. We get panicky over what we have, what we lost, what tomorrow is going to be. And we lose sight on the central act of all of humanity, which is Christ stretching out his arms, dying for humanity, saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Come to me with your sins and your pains and your questions and your heartache. My Father sent me on the world to love you to build a relationship back. My hope, my heart is to leverage every opportunity to kind of remind you of this. The cross matters more than your circumstances. Jesus reigns from this day forevermore. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I don't know how long it's going to last. Might get worse, might get better. But God stays the same. Jesus is still trustworthy. He's my anchor. He's my rock. He can be yours as well. I've been doing all kinds of this side reading right now, a lot of it on World War II, and I came across a story about a pastor. Um, his last name is Barnhouse, and uh, he was speaking in London, and then he had a week off, and then he was going to go speak in Belfast, Ireland. And Germany was starting to do more than armament. They were actually moving troops around and the tensions were building. And he's getting on a plane in London to go visit his family who's vacationing in France on the coast in a place called Normandy. So he, he's getting ready to board the plane and the person said, so what's your plans? He says, well, I'm going to fly down and visit my family for a week and then I got to be back in Belfast. And the, the person in the airport said, well, if you got to be in Belfast on Saturday, you better just go now. You won't be able to make it back. We're, there's not going to be an airplane for you. He's like, no, no, no. You're blowing this out of proportion. It's not going to get crazy that quick. It's not going to change that fast. So he flies down. He's actually in Normandy with his family, and he took pictures. And one of the side notes of what I was reading was that the United States military actually used some of his vacation pictures to do some of the planning and plotting for the Normandy invasion on D-Day. Well, Come Thursday, Germany has moved, and people are waiting for the announcement that uh, England was going to declare war, and the tensions are rising, and he finds out, like, if I don't leave now, there's no way I'm going to get there. Uh, So he he gets on a train. He takes a train to Paris, and the whole way he just sees more and more troops getting on the trains, saying their goodbyes as he passes through each village. France had mobilized every male to come and be a part of the war effort. From Paris, he takes another train and sees more of the same as he works his way to the northern coast where he hops on a a, a steam liner and he gets across uh, to the other side to England and he is on the last civilian boat that made that voyage. Gets on another train and he starts seeing all of these soldiers coming one way on trains Meanwhile, all of these kids getting boarded on a train to go north. There's never been a time like this. He's got an image, he says, of seeing a little boy, chocolate-stained face, 
crying, no one around. Panic. Gets on another train, another train. It's now Sunday morning at 3 a.m. when he pulls into Belfast and uh, his friends come and pick him up. They're going to take him to a a church called St. Enoch's. And it was at the time probably the largest church in Ireland. And uh, he's got about eight hours before his message. And the minister there thanked Barnhouse over and over again for being there. The church will be full of lads who will never come back, he said. I pray God will give you something for them. And as the group started into the church, the thought occurred to Barnhouse that everyone would be home listening to the radio because Chamberlain, who was in charge of England at the time, was probably going to declare war. Yet he walks in and the church is packed. And he ends up coming up with these words from Jesus to speak to the congregation. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Never been a more timely verse. Wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus says, do not be troubled. So Barnhouse, he starts recounting all the series of events that brought him from the coast of France and every site he saw on the way up to get to Belfast. And then he talked about the horrors and he would then he would he would say, but do not be troubled. And he'd talk about the little boy and he'd say, do not be troubled. And he would see the, the moms crying and say, do not be troubled. And he'd see the soldiers leaving and he'd say, do not be troubled. And it keeps building and you can feel the weight of the room building. He moves on. And he says this. He says, thousands of children will be torn away. And we're told, do not be troubled. These are either the words of God or a madman. Who in the midst of all this can say, don't be troubled? Either it's God who sees all of time, all the time, and he's moving his kingdom forward, or it's someone crazy. I'm I'm looking at you, wherever you are. Who is God to you? For me, I want to invite you to put your faith and trust and confidence in Jesus Christ, the one who can say on this day and this week and in this lifetime, do not be troubled. For I've already overcome the world. Let's pray. Father God, I ask, I plead that you would hear us, that we come to you in authenticity, that we can be honest, that you can handle our cries for how long? How long, God? we can know that even if we don't get the answer we want or the clarity, you are still good. You are still God. And you're still seeing things through for your kingdom's sake. If you're watching this and you just just need a little bit of hope, can I pray right now? God, there's people who just need hope. Would your spirit fill them right now? They just sense your closeness. Would this just be a quiet moment between them and you? You speak to their heart. You affirm who they are. You let them know you see them. He sees you. You can put your trust in him. So may the peace of God be with you all. Amen. Thanks again for worshiping with us today. We hope that you enjoyed it. To stay connected with The Bridge throughout the week, follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Have a great day and we'll see you online again soon. 